Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Hey, Tashin. Thanks for having me. So uh, I know we'll end up talking about good things like climate and Alexander technique, but I would love to start with the most important topic, which is uh, talking about Anjuna and EDM. <laughs> and I would love to hear how you got into all that stuff. Yeah, sure. I mean, first of all, I'm so happy that I've got you into it as well. That's such, such a, a win for my year, I think. Yes, you, <laughs> um, very, you've gotten me very into it. Excellent. So I guess for those who haven't um, heard of Anjuna Beats, it's the record label, um, which I love. They're created by my favorite band, Above and Beyond. And my, my origin story, I guess discovery story with Anjuna was I was at Glastonbury Festival, which I don't know if you've heard of. It's like a big festival in the UK, five days long in a field. Um, and it was my first time attending the festival, uh, going with some new friends who are a friend of a friend. And it was the last day of this five day festival. And this new friend, Kev, said, oh, hey, above and beyond a plane. And I'm like, who? And it's like, do you like trance? I'm like, yeah, I, I like kind of EDM-y stuff. It's like, OK, you have to come. You have to come. You have to come. And it was the last set of the, the festival. And just to give a sense of the context behind this, it's all outside, like right? you camp, and there's nowhere to sit down except the ground. And it was a rainy year. So we were walking around in like big leg, like Wellington boots for five days, only sitting in the tent and just absolutely ruined, basically. <laughs> I was completely exhausted. It was hard to move. And I was like, ready to go home. And then Kev said, okay, let's do above and beyond. And the music came and I was like, I have found my people. I have found the music I've been looking for for so many years and like this is it and ever since then i've gone to all all kinds of like above and beyond gigs and the and wider and juno gigs as well i flew to prague to go do one of their um live shows uh, abgt 350 that one was and i've got a bunch of my friends into them as well saying hey hey try this hey listen to this hey i think you'll enjoy this so now all my friends are into it as well it's fantastic mm -hmm. how would you describe sort of the uh like ethos of the the whole above and beyond and Andrew and like what appeals to you about it because I mean I, yeah how would you describe that it's very like earnestly lovey I think something like that it's like you go into the the gigs the concerts and they have these screens up and they so one of them I think Parvo types messages in like right uh, real time as the gig is going on and it's stuff like look around, um, hug your new friends, or we are all we need, and life is one of small moments like this, and that kind of thing. It's a very, and the lyrics of the songs are very much, um, almost like emotional processing, I wanna say. It's like kind of giving an opportunity to go and access love, grief, loss, excitement, all these kinds of emotions that don't often come up, or you don't like, give yourself a chance to go into. And the lyrics are they're usually quite cheesy, but they're still enough for you to connect with. So the vibe is very much like very friendly. It's very much about connection. There's a, a, a term for people who go to gigs with your around the world, Anjuna family. So you, you've met your Anjuna family, you go to the concerts with them, you maybe fly around the world with them and that kind of thing. Um, and it's just one of, yeah, it's, it's one about love and connection ultimately. Cool. Cool. Well, I've so enjoyed listening to their music and cool. <laughs> really appreciate you introducing me to them. It's been a definitely a highlight of this year. So thank you for that. No worries. Well, for the for everyone else listening, um, Tashin asked for a podcast that would make him feel a certain sequence of emotions. And I was like, oh, a playlist. I can, yeah, I can, a playlist. Yeah, I can make yeah. this. <laughs> I've got uh -huh. something for you. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just so much fun going, okay, you want these emotions in this order. And then ending with enormous climax. I'm like, yeah, okay, I can I can order these songs based on everything just and Juno. It was fantastic to really good fun to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you included that. Um, the piece at the end as well, like a, a oh, yeah. couple of days later, the uh, and and I will kiss piece because well, one, it's just such an epic track, but um, I've really loved like learning about that track and how it was created, nice. and I didn't know about the Olympic ceremony, so uh, and I ended up including that um, in a recent piece about collaboration because it's just such yeah. a like magnificent story of collaboration. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you for that as well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm pleased you like it. Um, yeah, so maybe you could, uh, I would love to just hear from you, like, who you are and, and what mm. your sort of story has been uh, in whatever detail or length you'd like to share how you got to mm. being here today. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny story because it's changed quite a lot in the last year or two. So I guess the, the my origin is 
grew up not far from London here in the UK, um, had a fairly normal um, life. I was very left brained, um, very kind of, I wouldn't say rationalist, but rational in my way of thinking and seeing the world. So that means I, I studied physics at university and then spent 10 years in low carbon energy innovation and climate tech and that kind of thing. Um, along the way, I had a go at a startup. Um, I did some freelancey stuff. I was like, I was interested in the whole gig economy thing from an early age, but my 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 view on the world was very scientific, uh, materialist kind of perspective. Then in 2014, I stumbled into this thing called Aizan Technique, which I'm sure we'll touch on at some point. Um, and I was like, oh, this is this is interesting. <laughs> this is uh, a, a new dimension of life, um, and that kind of became a parallel part of my life from 2014 until uh, well now um so it was quite a fun experience um managing working for big corporates doing energy innovation while also doing this slightly hard to describe thing on the side um and yeah i guess the 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 thing that's happened in the last couple of years a couple of months and years is that i, I quit my job to do this thing full time and step fully into the creator economy um which has been a lot of fun um, I've condensed a lot of stuff there, but that's the general shape of, of my, my life until now. Yeah. Can you tell me more about what the sort of like climate part of your career involved and, and what that was? Yeah. So I guess it's best to describe it in terms of management of low carbon tech innovation. So I never worked in actually developing technology. I worked in various, um, various contexts that would help accelerate the progression of technologies along the innovation chain from that early stage R&D through to full deployment. So that was in consulting. I, my, the main thing I did that had the most impact, I think, I was at a company called National Grid, um, which is a transmission system operator, kind of the, the balance of supply and demand of power in the UK. My job there was to design innovation projects that would help them do that, that balancing job more effectively in the future. So I never actually worked on the tech, but it was kind of how do we, what do we invest in? Um, what things are most valuable to reduce climate impact, um, to make the grid more efficient, all that kind of stuff. Um, and along the way, I also co-founded a nonprofit called the Carbon Removal Center, which um, the idea is to help accelerate the removal of carbon from the atmosphere. And actually that started, and I missed a funny point in my story. My first job um, slash kind of post-university thing, um, I worked at an organization called the Royal Society, um, where I worked on the, the governance of the research of solar radiation management. Now what that means is solar geoengineering, the reflection of sunlight back into space to reduce the effects of climate change, or the warming effects in particular. So there's normally like people think of mirrors in space, ultimately kind of a big space mirrors up there, reflect the sunlight, call the earth. There's a wonderful um, Simpsons episode where I think Mr. Burns blocks out the sun, um, that kind of vibe. Um, that's not how you would do it, um, but same kind of idea. And ever since then, I've been interested in kind of the, the non-traditional interventions that could be done to, to ultimately reduce the effects of, but in my view, long-term thing we should be aiming for is to reverse climate change itself. So done a few things around there as well. Does your work in the climate uh, sector leave kind of a case for climate optimism in your mind? I think so. Um, I certainly act as if it does. So I don't think we're past any particularly terrifying tipping tepp points, so there are some probably coming up. Um, and there's a lot that we still can do. So so far most of the efforts of humanity if you like have focused on what's called mitigation so reducing the emission of new carbon into the atmosphere we've done some work on what's called adaptation so you know new insurance products flood um, defenses that kind of thing um, but we're really missing um, restoration so kind of putting things back to how they used to be and if, in fact improving them further and then the emergency button of geoengineering if we need that um, but i think we still have time, we still have technology, we still have scope to do things that can move us away from the two plus degrees of warming that I think we're, we're now looking, okay, we are now looking like we're going to hit two degrees, but there's still plenty that we can do to avoid going beyond that. Um, it doesn't look like we're acting fast enough, but I think if you look, um, if you look around, you do see kind of signs of hope. So new carbon removal, um, 
initiatives are popping up all the time there's a lot more money going into mitigation that kind of thing and people are kind of waking up to the fact that these things are an issue there is some interesting human psychology around climate change so the fact that your impact doesn't translate to um, actual effects and the effects are delayed against what people do um, but it seems like the last couple of years of extreme weather and general noise making of advocacy groups and that kind of thing have been waking people up to the need to change and I think once there's enough people who want to make that change and there's enough political will which seems to be growing then things can happen very quickly I think and the technology is improving so it often looks bleak I think sometimes I feel like it's bleak but at the same time there's a lot going on um, that we can still do um, that can not just put things back to how they were but can go beyond and what I think is important is to restore and enhance natural systems. What kind of um... Yeah, can you give me a little bit more detail about what kind of interventions those might involve? Mm. So at the carbon removal um, scale, and the reason I picked that one is that the other areas are kind of, they're more easily done. I mean, as in we know what the answers would be. Actually doing them is hard. So we need to say fully decarbonize heat in the UK and decarbonizing heat is very difficult, um, but we know that that needs to be done ultimately. Um, and there are initiatives going ahead. But in carbon removal, there are there are different technologies that you can deploy, different ways of thinking about it, which I think um, point to a deeper philosophical um, approach behind this. So for example, you could plant lots of trees, right? You can stop deforestation and do what's called afforestation, so plant loads of new trees and that kind of thing. And as they grow, they absorb carbon. That's a really good thing to do. But it's also not enough, unfortunately because the carbon math doesn't work out. You can also do things like wetland restoration, rewilding, sustainable agriculture, um, regenerative agriculture. Um, you can deploy artificial trees, which are just these like enormous um, machines where air passes through them and carbon um, gets absorbed from them. Each of these only have different proponents. Um, so people who are like, the ones who prefer hyperloops and hydrogen cars and that kind of thing, and like, yeah, science, they prefer artificial trees. And then you get other people who are like, well, let's focus on the natural systems and do um, soil restoration. And ultimately, all of these things need to be done. Um, but I'm just really excited by the, the diversity of pathways that are available to us. And the fact that this topic seems to be focusing people's minds on taking action. So we can all agree that something needs to be done. And in this, and it's, uh, the domain of carbon removal, we already know that even if we stop emitting all carbon overnight, we're still committed to a certain amount of warning, warming. So we have to go not just to zero, but negative for a while to reset to how things were. So we can all agree that whether it's um, planting new trees, whether it's improving ecosystems, whether it's artificial trees or whatever else it might be, the technologies can overlap and play a parallel role, but we can all get behind the need to actually go ahead and deploy these things um, at the meta level almost. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, it's, it's nice to ask about because uh, I think I've been sort of steeped in climate pessimism for a while. And uh, I think there's a case for that, but it's it's nice to hear a different account. And like, you know, I don't think anybody knows for sure what's going to happen. And as you say, there's a lot of sort of options and different mm -hmm. pathways and interventions and so on. So it, it's nice to hear about uh, a different possible route from you. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I'm, I'm pleased, and it, it's interesting answering that question because I'm you didn't I didn't name any one particular technology. It's like I'll be fine because wind power, or because yeah, algae or something. I didn't say that because I can't, like you said, there's no way of knowing. There's no silver bullet ultimately. I guess what I'm encouraged by is seeing climate change is becoming more of a forcing function, more of a kind of an organizing principle that people are finally rallying around in a useful way, and that's what gives me hope not the some of the numbers that we see in the reports or this new innovation over here in isolation is the is the mindset behind it of mm. okay let's just get on with it now ultimately totally totally that makes sense yeah yeah right mm. yeah i'd love to shift gears and ask you about the alexander technique and, and maybe you could just start by describing what it is uh, for those that might not know yet yeah so the best way I found to describe Alexander technique in this kind of context is to reference that Viktor Frankl quote. So between stimulus and response area of the space, um, and in that space lies something, something, capacity for growth and freedom. 
And I recently found out actually that Victor Frankl never said that. Um, it's been misattributed to him the whole time, but everyone knows it as him, so let's go with it. So let's say stimulus and response, and then space between. A design technique is a way to notice and then expand and live in that space between stimulus and response. That's actually one of the core skills of AT, it's called inhibition, is noticing that you could respond in a habitual way and then choosing something else instead. The, the frame for this or the context for this is that we, we do things that we don't realize that we're doing. We pick up a lot of habits and our functioning, our, the way that we use ourselves is unconscious in many ways. So Alessandro Technique is a way of bringing consciousness to all of the things that we are doing and then learning how to constructively not do them. Um, so it, it ties in a lot with cessation, non-doing, and there are some intersections with spiritual practice as well. But purely at the, the experiential level, it's, huh, I noticed that I'm doing something I don't want to be doing or didn't realize I was doing, and that thing isn't good for me or I don't think it's helping me. That's one level. And another level is actually being able to not do that. So Alexander himself, when he realized of his backstory, he lost his voice as an actor and then developed it while figuring out how to get his voice back. He realized that he was doing certain things to himself in the speaking context. He was, he was pulling his neck back and down and putting pressure on his larynx. And even when he knew that he was doing that, he saw it in a series of mirrors, he couldn't stop himself from doing it. And whenever he tried to stop doing it, he just made it worse even. So he had to learn a new way of consciously doing, doing cessation, we could put it that way, or stopping the thing he was doing, which was not a normal um, thing he had access to, if you like. There was no button he could push that would stop. Ultimately, he had to learn how to push that button and where, how it worked and that kind of thing. So yeah, Alessandro Technique is a way of consciously improving our functioning by noticing and stopping doing things that we don't want to be doing. What did your training in AT involve? Oh man, <laughs> so I had very, very unconventional training. Um, okay, some, some backstory here. Like most AT teachers and training courses look the same. They are three years long, they take 1600 hours and they're part-time. Um, so it's very difficult for someone like me to decide I'm going to go off and become an AT teacher because it requires a fundamental reshaping of your life ultimately. So you can do that for three years. I would never have done that personally. So my training, um, very unconventional was part-time evenings and weekends only. So I spent one month, a, one weekend a month for three years and then a series of evenings and some trips away and that kind of thing. And the actual experience of it was the most free form, non-coercive, non-directed training experience I've ever had ultimately. So two examples that I'll, I'll bring here. So my teacher, Peter Nobes, um, would get us at first juniors, junior trainees, and we would work one-on-one -on -one with him in front of the group of trainees. And we would get direct education that we do at tuition, and then others would pick up kind of what's going on and kind of learn by osmosis almost. He'd call those master classes, and they were really good, really helpful. But then we'd, we'd be sent off into group practice. And I'm not kidding, but the kind of prompts that we get are go and play with freedom and aliveness and, and kind of report back. Go and go and play with freedom to, not freedom from these things. And it's like, uh, okay, um, sure, <laughs> let's go and do that. Um, and the thing is, it actually made sense. It worked. So you can go and put your hand on someone's back or neck or something and play with freedom and aliveness and embody that and, and communicate that and listen for that and that kind of thing and change the way you're being in a way that does actually make sense. And just to add here, like it was very peculiar doing this alongside working in energy innovation consulting for big corporate because I'm like, why am I, what am I doing? This is, this is a, just a very different thing, but it really helped me like having those two worlds because I was very much the empiricist of the group. So when, when someone said like, oh, you know, this happens and this happens, I was like, well, let me, let me test that theory. Let me go off and like design my own little hypotheses that I could test and see what happens. Often I just didn't even say I was doing this, I was just in my own head and then say, well, I, I played with this. And, and I guess 
without even realizing it, I was playing into the training modality of like go off and play with X and see what happens. I thought I was being kind of all clever and sciencey, um, but that's exactly what we're being asked to do. So yeah, very free form, very open, very fun, very much find out for yourself kind of kind of uh, frame. Can you say um, what, I, I wanna talk about how your online course was developed, but I would love to hear more about kind of the, the precursors in um, Alexander technique and how it's taught of like, what would it, what would an in-person training involve that is sort of like based mm -hmm. in of being in the same location with someone and uh, physically close to them and stuff like that? Yeah, okay. So if you came in for an in-person lesson, well, I guess there's, there's two ways of thinking about this. Going, to, I'm not going to talk about the conventional, traditional approach because I've had less experience with that. But let's say you came to teach, came to see one of um, my my group ultimately. We would probably first of all do some kind of physical, um, I don't want to say intervention, but there would be. I would put my hand on your neck, um, on your back, or something. Probably make a small adjustment between the relationship between your skull and your spine. Ultimately, um, it kind of looks like like this um, in a in person context. And this switches on what Alexander called the primary control, which is a term he got from, I think, a, a different anatomist at some point. Um, he was a long time ago now, so it's nothing up to date, unfortunately. Um, and this is a thing that theoretically all animals have. It's a coordination mechanism. It's the thing that you see in wild animals, let's say a, a, a kind of a, a, a large cat when they're hunting something, one of the uh, panther type things. They're, kind of, they're very much in this kind of tracking switched on fully coordinated by the thing they're hunting mode and that's the thing that largely we have switched off in our day-to-day -day experience kind of this, this slumpy hunched thing um and most people come into a lesson in their outside slumpy hunch mode um unfortunately there's no way out of this directly because if you recognize that you're slumpy hunched then you'll think okay well i should be up here right and then suddenly you're in slumpy hunch mode just holding yourself up with muscle <laughs> so what we show people how to do is we, we guide them into this new experience. We show them this way of being and then play with various things in that frame. So conventionally it would be sitting and standing or picking something up or that kind of thing. My teacher likes to play catch, but the, the whole, the whole frame of it is noticing when someone, how do I frame this? When someone stops taking responsibility for themselves and steps out of direct experience. So let's say, I said playing catch or something, it's very common for someone, the teacher to throw the ball and then to, for the student to go like, like start coordinating the catch. It's like, it's really important that I catch the ball and that kind of thing. Or even when you drop the ball going, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And then, you know, all these extra things were laid on. And the teacher's job is like, why, you know, why are you doing any of that stuff? This is the least important thing you'll ever do. Is what Peter always said to me, like in this room, there's just you and me, no one's watching. It doesn't matter if you drop this ball and yet you can't stop yourself from kind of apologizing and scurrying to pick it up and then kind of acting out, throwing it back again, all that kind of stuff. So it's very much tuning into the students, um, their own subjective experience, almost their own qualia and saying, Hey, where have you gone? Hey, you've gone somewhere. You've got in your head somewhere. You're not fully present and bringing them back over and over and over again, using various different tools. It might just be say, Hey, keep looking at my eyes while I throw you this ball. It might be inviting them to pay attention to the space around them, all that kind of stuff. But it's, it almost feels like magic when it's done to you because the teacher will say like, hey, where did you just go? And when you are when you are off in your head somewhere and someone pulls you back into the present moment, there is a bizarre experience of, yeah, I was somewhere. I did just go somewhere. But you never notice this on your own because whenever you come back, you kind of forgot that you were gone somewhere. You kind of come back naturally. So to have someone kind of reach in while you're gone and say, hey, kind of come back. It's like, well, okay, that's weird. And then you kind of learn how to do that for yourself over time as well. Um, so yeah, that's a, a lot of words, but kind of roughly the shape of the thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what does, uh, how does your coursework and what, do, what does it teach about Alexander Technique? Yeah, so my, my course obviously doesn't have the benefit of hands-on, <laughs> one-to-one um, work. Uh, so I can't give people that experience. I can't put my hand on their neck and say, okay, this is the thing you're looking for, ultimately. Um, but what I've what I learned from my training was that when you were in this mode, 
there was a particular experiential uh, thing, um, an expansion of awareness, ultimately. And this had a couple of characteristics. So first of all, you can be aware of the world in all dimensions, in all directions. It's all there at once, and you're kind of in the middle of it. Whereas normally we kind of narrow down a little bit, like I would narrow onto the screen and narrow onto you and like just forget the world is there almost. So that expansion happened. But not only that, there was the vividness to it. So the world seemed brighter, more colorful, more more just tangible. There's more depth to it, there's more realness, I guess I want to say. And that stuff is almost like a side effect of the hands-on work in most methods. We use it more directly in my training. Um, now, I realized after a bunch of experiments online that I could point people to that stuff in various different ways, whether on Twitter threads, which was surprising to me as well, um, calls and even on recordings. So now what I do is say, hey, there's this dimension of experience to do with your awareness that you might not know about. Let me show you some characteristics and effects that seem to be common to most people. And then once you've experienced and seen these things, show you how you can start applying this stuff in your own life. And then I invite people to treat their own lives as dojos ultimately. So now you know this stuff exists, go up and see what happens, which is very much like how I trained in, in the training center. Is there a skill tree for learning Alexander technique or the way that you're structuring the course? It's a really good question because I'd love to know if there is. Um, some people get it way more easy than other people. Um, so Nick Camerata um, from Twitter, like he took the course and then I, I saw him as wonderful. He was just like tweeting for a few days about like how he was walking around and like magic was happening. It was like, this is great. So he clearly had some on-ramp uh, that helped him get it. And I think there's something around existing mindfulness experience. Um, so I think he's done thousands of meditation hours. Um, there's a certain level of being embodied. So I'm not, you don't need to be fully embodied, but at least having access to interoception, you know, internal sensations is useful. Um, having some language around, um, you know, attention, awareness, the fact that these, these qualities exist and are not strange. Um, and I think, again, mindfulness training gives you that. And I think there's also some philosophy that comes in as well. So for some reason, critical rationalists seem to get this stuff as well. And I spoke to Luli um, and you know, Luli, I, we, we had a few Zoom calls um, early last year and then she wrote an amazing essay on the thing. Um, I was like, okay, clearly you have some kind of prior you know, like jigsaw pieces <laughs> that fit together that I'm saying that make this easier for you. Um, but I'm still looking for what all those things are ultimately. I'm not entirely sure. Um that makes sense that like having prior experience in these things would be really helpful. And, and certainly that was my experience, um, you know, taking your course. Um, if like, how, how did you structure what's in the course to like, like sequence it? And, and in terms of um, like, if someone did have that kind of on-ramp, like what would you want to take them through? Yeah. So the structure of the course was, it was built around a series of Zoom calls I did, basically. Um, and I'll share this stuff for any like aspiring course creators. Um, I'll, I'll say that like AT is the very last thing I would have picked to make an online course about. And you've taken it, you've seen the kind of stuff that's in there. It's like very subtle points around awareness, <laughs> which is not something I'd ever want to do online. Um, so I basically, the, the, the story was, I did a bunch of Twitter threads. People were interested and I was like, okay, I'm getting lots of questions about this thing. And I want to just, I had an experiment of like, I'll do some Zoom calls. I had a week off work. Let me just fill it with Zoom calls and do like a series of intro um, explainers. Um, and some of them went really well. Some were appalling. I was just basically playing with different ideas. But the more I did it, the more I found that the, the call format converged on a common, a common journey, if you like. And then I kind of got bored saying the same thing over and over again. I was like, oh, I can just re kind of record myself saying these things and people can do that. And then I can go deeper and expand it and that kind of thing. So that's how the course evolved. But the shape of the the, the calls and the, the, the course is similar. So first of all, like I point out certain elements of experience. So the first one is kind of expansion of awareness. And I use stuff like kind of, I'm using mostly audio prompts because people tend to be looking at the screen 
and you can look at the screen while also being aware of stuff at the same time. So the, the one I use in the course is, hey, if there were an aircraft going overhead, just check that you could notice it. Um, and the phrasing there is important because it's not actually go and listen for the aircraft or the sounds don't matter. It's opening yourself up to the availability that there could be things in that direction that you could notice, whether that's the thing there or not, not actually listening for aircraft. But it's like, hey, there's stuff that could be in that direction. There's stuff that could be in that direction and this expansion happens. So I open up that expansion. I then do a couple of tricks on people. So I, I kind of collapse it on purpose and say, hey, look, this thing that could be expanded can also be collapsed and look how easy that can be done. Um, and then from there, I teach what's called inhibition through the, the collapse and conscious re-expansion of, of ex uh, awareness. There's other stuff I want to get into around primary control, which is way more difficult to, to switch on um, in an online format. I will figure it out. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the general idea. And then I've laid in a bunch of other stuff around mindset and experiments and kind of exercises and stuff. But that's the, that's the core of the journey, if you like. I'm getting a sense there that like, uh, mm, yeah, that there might be a kind of skill tree that involves, you know, as priors, things like body awareness and yeah. exposure to concepts like attention and awareness, that those kinds of things are maybe not strictly necessary, but useful. And then once someone's sort of in your course that there's like expanding awareness and then there's, um, you know, inhibition, as you said, and then uh, yeah, like at some point, uh, getting to the primary control bit. Yeah. Um, does that, does that sound like an accurate summary of what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. Um, there are some people for whom it doesn't make any sense. And mm -hmm. this, this applies as much in, in person. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm reassured it's not just my teaching. It's also mm -hmm. that some people can come in for a lesson and just, they think they're having their bodies reorganized and it's almost like a treatment. Um, the way my, my teacher frames this is like, and anyone, anyone who comes in, it's like, yeah, I'll do the whole body stuff. And then, hey, there's a Zen garden over here. Um, and they'll go away and come back next week. I was like, okay, all that stuff. Hey, there's a Zen garden over here if you want to go have a look. Um, and some people get the Zen, as he, as he puts it. Other people don't get it. Um, I don't yet know why. It might be lack of those priors. It might be trying too hard. A lot of this stuff, you can get caught up in map territory conflation. And the more you realize that you're stuck, the more you try and you kind of look hard at the map, <laughs> ultimately. Um, the, the frame I use for the entire course is that wonderful essay um, from Slate Star Codex um, on getting out of the car, ultimately. Um, universal love, said the cactus person. Um, so, you know, you, you, you drive all the places um, and then you realize the places that can't, you can't go, you've got to get out of the car, but you've been in the car the whole, your whole life. So, like, what button do you have to push to get out of the car? Or you just get out of the car? Or how? You just you look for more buttons. Like, this is that. This is exactly the same thing. The harder you try to get out of the car, the more stuck you are in the car, ultimately. So all of this is showing people how to get out of the car. Um, some people I think are not ready to, some people are not willing to, or they just don't want to, you know, just, you know, it's not the thing they are uh, available for in their lives and that's fine. But one of the reasons I want kind of this lifetime resource is that, hey, it's there for you when you want to, like have these ideas in your awareness somewhere. Huh? And then when it's the right time, they'll be like, oh yeah, that, that course now seems relevant. Let me go have a look at it now. There's no forcing. There's no kind of, I want people to have an experience and people to kind of come through it and it evolve for them on their journey, ultimately. And you've started adding these sort of, uh, what you're calling like power packs of like different themed yeah. focuses on different skills. Can you talk more about like what you've made so far and what you're hoping to make in the future? Yeah, sure. So I did... So the first one is, um, I called it social and speaking skills. Um, and the reason that I, I thought about doing this is that AT is very much done in activity. So even in, in most conventional lessons, you'll go and then the teacher will say, so what do you want to work with today? And that might be picking up an object or sitting down or standing up or whatever it might be kind of, yeah, it's, it's all very much like, let's pick a day today thing that you can do. And AT in itself is almost devoid of content. It only really makes sense once you apply it to doing stuff like the dishes or going for a walk or walking the dog or whatever. So I wanted to add a series of these power-ups to give more concrete examples of the things that you can do with this stuff or the, the places where you can practice and then to pull out some of the benefits. So I picked speaking first because I did an online course called Ultra Speaking, which by the way is awesome. Um, and I realized basically that what they're pointing at is exactly the same stuff that AT is pointing at getting out of your way, speak without thinking, 
letting the creative parts of you come up without interference, um, doing less and achieving more, that kind of thing. And I thought, okay, cool. Well, if I can create something that that kind of gets to those same points, then I think it's just helpful to give people the sense of like, there's something I actually can do with this. If you go through my course, like, you have to come up with your own examples, your own lifestyle things. But if I say, well, when you're talking to your partner, when you're doing public speaking, when you're on a Zoom call, all of these things, it makes it much, much easier to kind of like, oh yeah, keep my awareness expanded while talking to someone and see what happens. It's a much more, um, it's more fun and, and it's an easier way of playing, I think. In terms of next ones, I think creativity is a big one. I'm really excited about creative process when it comes to getting out of the way, which is what AT is about. Um, and at some point I will do movement um, because that's where AT comes from ultimately. But I, I want to learn a lot more about anatomy and body mechanics and that stuff. And I always say it's not about posture. It's true, it's not about posture, but at the same time, it's a huge application area where it's mostly done. So I want to upskill myself in that domain and then I'll do that power up. Uh, that makes sense. And yeah, I'm, I'll be really curious to see uh, that one and any other upgrades you make in the future. It feels like, uh, I don't know, and taking the course for the first time really did feel like, uh, uh, yeah, like it rewired things for me. So uh, it's, it'd be nice to have more of that kind of thing. So I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that, but you know, you are the one asking questions. So, oh, well, sure. Um, um, it's, um, I mean, I, I think, and this was my intuition for being interested in the course in the first place was like, it wasn't so much that, um, you know, yeah, like I'd been exposed to expanded awareness type stuff before, and it was, it was not something I hadn't heard of, but I just really liked how you talked about it. And there were some specific things that, um, yeah, had, had a really big shift for me. I think um, probably the, the biggest one was, um, it was like, I could already get into an expanded awareness state and it was easy to do that, but then how to sort of more consistently be in it. And mm -hmm. you gave specific advice about like how to, return to it and it was sort of like um yeah i forget exactly how you put it but it was like if you've noticed that your awareness has contracted just like expand it again and then just for a few seconds and then you can decide what to do mm -hmm. and um you don't necessarily have to stay in the expanded awareness but just like that'll give you the option to decide what you want to do and yeah. uh, for whatever reason it was like the the specific instructions you gave in the next few days it was like very easy to um, keep re-expanding my awareness. And then that's, that's become to my perception, like more or less automatic at this point where right. I, I, it's, it's more often than not expanded. And then, uh, if it contracts, I notice it very quickly and just go right back. And, yeah. um, I think, yeah, actually, I think having a lot of experience with like concentration style practice has been helpful because, um, I can make use of that with this sort of specific use case and like stay mm -hmm. on keep my focus on having my awareness expanded and I just kind of get that built in for free so it it's just like I'm yeah expanded most of the time and um yeah and then the, the other I mean there were a couple of other really cool things of like um trying the Vishnu hands thing for the first time right. and like I that's still something I want to explore more but it's sort of like um for those that don't know it's like uh finding a new way to make motions where you sort of set an intention to move, but you're not causing it to move. And then it can sort of like move by itself. And uh, as I've told you in the past, that's had some really interesting like blends into my Tai Chi practice. And right. uh, especially for things that are like, cause each week I learn like a new move in the Tai Chi practice. And there have been a few sequences that are like, especially difficult for me to sort of absorb. And then uh, I found myself applying that there and, and the movement sort of came more naturally and um, yeah. And then, and then I'd say like, just in general, there's a lot of um, sort of like interesting stuff about uh, when you use those skill sets in mm. specific situations, like, yeah, like interacting with people or on the podcast or, uh, you know, various circumstances. And it um, that's always the most interesting thing is like what comes up when I have more options from expanding yeah. my awareness. Yeah. Nice. Cool. No, I'm pleased to hear. Yeah. It's it's funny, like 
I think one of the skills that you clearly have is is mindfulness, obviously. So you can notice when your mind is off somewhere. You can the ability to notice in the moment is there for you. And most people don't have that, I found. So when I trained, it was, oh yeah, this thing is great. Of course I'll carry this into my life. Like, sure. And then within an hour of leaving the, the training center, I'm like, oh, it's all gone, thinking about work and whatever. And the the the, the meta mindfulness of like checking that you're mindful almost was not there and that's the thing that i cultivated and that at cultivates is that constant meta awareness of how aware am i in this moment ultimately what am i aware of and that doesn't impinge on concentration it just means huh i'm aware that i'm concentrating right now (laughs) i'm aware that i'm aware of that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and that's the dimension that at gets to that i think a lot of people just don't have from day-to-day experience because there's no need to have it we just get hooked on things really easily Mm -hmm. yes yes yeah that Mindfulness definitely helps and uh, interesting. It sort sort of like deepened my sort of standards for what being mindful are. And like, I have a a continual sense of like, yeah, this could keep deepening. Like I have a sense of what it would be like to be even more mindful, more continuously. And uh, that's, that's sort of something I'm always trying to go deeper into. So um, I think these skills really are like mutually reinforcing. So yeah, if someone had a different skill, that would be useful for bringing in and oh like the the loving kindness is useful as well for just like uh just like blasting myself with love if if i've like uh you know something awkward like actually er earlier in this podcast actually um for the first like two minutes i had the setting on wrong so it was just showing your face and i was like oh i need to change it so it's showing both of our faces for the video and it's just like oh "Oh, like this is not the end of the world no one's gonna care like michael's not gonna hate me and just just, like radiate love towards myself and uh you know that's sort of like an interesting fusion of of the two of like having the awareness and it's oh this Mm. is the setting is wrong and then i will blast myself with love and so on yeah it's such a great example right because in that in that context you were aware of the fact that the screen setting was wrong Mm -hmm. you were aware of your own judgments towards yourself and there were judgments going on you were having the conversation and you were aware that matter was an option for you and that you could do matter and then you did matter yeah while also other stuff as well while yes. still having attention on me like that's, that's yeah. cool that's really a useful skill to have and i didn't notice yeah 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 <laughs> yes uh that happens often during this podcast i don't know like yeah. i'll uh but my, my inner experience during these things is, is fascinating to me so just like different voices that come up and like concerns yeah. and i'm just like loving on myself and like treating the different parts and still being aware of the conversation and yeah, talking totally. to people so yeah and this is why i think awareness is such a valuable thing because if you're so just to bring us on the at frame like if your awareness is collapsed and you don't notice those things then you can't uh, respond in any way towards them. So like, let's say you're, there is a part of you that's upset or judging you or feeling sad that you got made a mistake, but you don't notice that. It's not like it isn't there. Mm-hmm. It's just that you're not noticing that it's there. You just feel bad for some reason. So you can't relate. But if your awareness is expanded, I don't just mean outside down there. I also mean in like psychologically and internally and all that kind of stuff. Then, oh, look, there's that thing. It's not taking up all of my experience, but I can relate to it while I'm doing other stuff as well. So mm-hmm. when I'm talking now, I often see different ideas for things I could say popping up in my head because they're coming from somewhere that isn't me. Um, and I'm going like, no, no, yeah, that one maybe <laughs> kind of thing <laughs> while still talking. Whereas I think, again, a lot of people just like they get stuck thinking through what they're going to say next while they're speaking and they get some stuck or they, they land on the first thing that comes up and then they get stuck on that or they had a bad morning and that gets them stuck at these things. So awareness gets you the the chance to get unstuck from all of these things, to get unhooked from all of these things that might get in your way. I just think it's really cool. Yeah, definitely. No, yeah, I I agree. Yeah. Um, And that's part of why I wanted to ask as well about sort of the skill tree is because I I have, Mm. you know, I have asked you about this recently as well, but just a sense of like, what things I have learned from your course and what I haven't and kind of want to like map that territory so I can <clears throat> dive deeper into this stuff. So, you know, the, the primary control, for example, I, I don't think I've mm. gotten a hang of that. And, um, you know, inhibition, I, I sort of figured out, like I, I watched your section on it, but then like, it just sort of like learned itself, not from the course, yep. just from practice. So, mm-hmm. uh, but the primary control, I don't, I don't think I have a handle on that yet. So I'll be 
curious to see what you develop with that. Yeah, that one. Let's see if I can add live on that slightly. Um, okay. But the, the, the primary control is like, it's the naturally switched on aliveness that we all have access to, but that isn't always on. And you'll often see AT teachers using metaphor here. Um, and actually there's a, there's a discussion we can have here. So one of the most common examples is to imagine a, a thread on top of your head kind of pulling you up kind of thing. I dislike this <laughs> because first of all, like imagining is going off imagining. Like you got like, oh yeah, there's the, there's the golden thread pulling up my head. And like, you can see what's happened here to me, right? I'm no longer yeah. talking to you. I've, I've cut off imagining something. Um, so I don't like that. I use a similar thing in my course around um, just knowing there's a gravitational field pulling you up. Um, but again, I think there's the same kind of stuckness that comes up. So there's two things to say here. One is that a lot of the stuff I point to is what I call sub visualization. I think someone in my, my course forum came up with the term, which is where like you can just flash the idea of something. So you can flash the idea of there being a force pulling you up. Or you can go off and imagine the, the the visual thing that goes with it. And I'm talking about the flashing, the just knowing the thing, as opposed to creating visual images in your mind. Um, and this, I don't see this talked about very much um, in other literatures, the idea that mm. no, you're not visualizing, you're just activating some circuit, ultimately, even pre, pre visually, pre conceptually, it's just switched on, you're available to it. Um, some people get that, some people don't, unfortunately. Um, but the, way, the other thing I want to say is that how I'm playing with primary control now is like you right now are not a crumpled mass of bones in the floor, right? Even though there's gravity pulling you down, you're still clearly upright. And your body has evolved in the context of gravity always being down. And so it has this natural way of holding itself up. So you don't actually have to hold yourself up with gravity. Your body is naturally upright. You just have to stop interfering with that process. So a way I'm playing with it now is, yes, recognize that there's this downward pull, that you're being pulled towards the earth, that the, the earth is supporting you, and that there is this corresponding upward flow of, of muscle support, of however your evolutionary system has designed you to be, that is floating you up um, in opposition, balanced to this gravitational force. And whatever that upward thing is, that's the primary control. And it is related to once you fully accept gravity, once you fully like believe that you are being pulled down and then also supported by, then you can get into this thing. Hmm. The issue is when it's like, okay, I'm being pulled down. Therefore I have to hold myself up. That's where we layer in a certain kinds of muscle tension. And those things actually interfere with the natural processes. Once you switch those things off and just know that you have this upward, so like internally supporting thing, then things become lighter and easier. Mm. But yeah, I have yet to find consistent ways into properly explaining this and switching on without putting my hand on someone's neck, but I, I will, there will be, I will find a way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's really helpful. Cause I think, um, well, one, I love the description of the flashing because that's something that's definitely the flashing of images. And that's definitely something that's come up for me. Like, that, that's certainly my experience with the Vishnu hands, for example, of like yeah. flashing the image of like the way I want my hands to be in a Tai Chi form or something uh, yeah. and like how, not figuring out how to get there, but just getting there. Um, and then, yeah, like exploring why there's upwardness in direct experience because I, I, there's a sort of a meta problem with these things of like, and I think it's related to what you're talking about of like providing an image and how like an image can cause someone to go into their head. But like, for me, I've seen again and again where like something can be pointed to by a teacher or a book or whatever, um, or even you have a sense of it internally of like, this should be possible, but then your concept of the thing can get in the way of you actually discovering the thing in your own experience. And I very, I think that's part of my hesitation with the primary control is like, um, uh, you know, it was certainly the case with expanded awareness or inhibition of like the way in which these things are talked about is just different than my own direct experience of them. And yeah. the metaphors that I would use for my experience aren't the metaphors that someone else would use. And um, so I, I want to just looking at upwardness in my own experience seems like a pointer to like discovering it in my own experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I really want everyone to become kind of amateur phenomenologist of their mm -hmm. own experience. Like the fact that I can describe that there's visualization and there's something beneath the visualization that's just a flashing or activation of it. You're like, yes, I, I know what you mean. I also can't describe it, but it's like they are different. Yes. That's interesting. That's the mm -hmm. stuff I want to get to. Um, and you said something really interesting there around around getting stuck in the concept. Uh, I forget how you framed it, but this is a like the main experience people have in training in AT, at least in, in the school I trained in, which is there's different ways in every time, basically. So in one week, it might be, oh, I know what AT is. I know how to get out of the state. It's to try less hard. Okay, cool. That's easy. I've got it. And then the next day, even, it's like, I, uh, okay, try less hard. I was trying less hard. How do I try less hard? Like, oh, I've lost it. Um, and over and over again, you get stuck. The concept works the first time. The metaphor works once and then stops working. And you have to go through a number of these cycles to figure out, I call it the finger. Well, I don't, the Zen people call it the finger that points to the moon is not the moon. You have to go cycle through enough fingers ultimately before you figure out what the moon is. Um, and yeah, like the fact that it works once and stops working is itself part of the journey. I, when I was, um, when I was training, I came up with a very annoying definition for the other trainees uh, for what AT is. I said, Alizana Technique is the skill of letting go of what you thought it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ultimately. Because uh -huh. um, like, it's that level of meta. Like, as soon as you're stuck in something, like believing that it is one way, that's not Alizana Technique. You have to then apply Alizana Technique to release yourself from that stuckness. And I, that one has held. That definition has held for me. But I can mm -hmm. never start there because no one will understand what I mean if I just <laughs> start by saying that. And it's like an hour of preamble before that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Uh, uh, I think I <clears throat> heard you talking recently about wanting to like do uh, research on the Alexander mm -hmm. technique, and I would be curious to hear you talk more about that and what kind of research you might like to do and what that would look like. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, what I want to learn basically is, it's going to sound weird, but what AT is ultimately. So I've learned that there is this set of things. I know that they work. I don't know how they work or why they work. And I want to know how they work. Um, because I, despite kind of having a, a lot of kind of a strong tolerance for woo, I still think that things have a, a scientific basis, like that the universe reflects how things work and there must be a, a mechanism by which these things work. I don't know what they are. I'm not sure people, I don't think it is known what they are. And I want to know what these mechanisms are. So the research might be stuff like, I'm particularly interested in neuroscience right now. I'm reading a book called The Martian's Emissary, which is excellent. Um, and I think speaks directly to um, the same stuff. Uh, for anyone who's read it, left, right hemisphere is awareness, left hemisphere is, con is concentration or attention. And I think AT is a way of bringing balance and um, appropriate control between the two two hemispheres but that's a different conversation i think um so neuroscience for one i want to learn more about the anatomy so why is it that okay this needs a tangent but it's worth it um in a lesson the way i i work now is to to teach other people who are trained to become teachers that's the main way i work and a common way of training a common experience in the, in the training is they will put their hand on my back and I can't see them necessarily. And they'll do stuff with their awareness and listen for my awareness. And there's a lot of information that can be transferred that way. Now, I've done this so many times now that I know it's true. and I've had enough testing. But just without even looking at them, I can tell what's happening in their mind just by, the, by picking up what's happening in my awareness. So if my awareness starts collapsing and I know that it's not coming from me because I've got control over my awareness, I know that they're mind wandering, that their awareness is collapsing. I have no idea how this works. <laughs> I have zero clue what's being transferred, what mechanisms are employed here, but I'm very curious. And I was very suspicious at first because, you know, physics, science, like this doesn't seem like it should work. Um, but actually, like, not only have I done this like for thousands of hours now, but I would say, hey, this is happening to you, isn't it? Yes, it is. Do this instead. Oh, that worked. Cool. How did I know? I don't know how I knew. I just knew <laughs> this kind of <laughs> stuff. And I just want to dig into that ultimately. So what are the what are the biological mechanisms behind it? And how does it interact with other other systems, if you like? Um, I'm curious if there are links to nutrition, even um, and inflammation, for example, like just the, the wider uh, functioning of 
the human organism. There's a lot to be dug into, I think. Um, and I think the AT field hasn't done enough until now to explore those intersections with other stuff. Because if we can, we can figure out what else is out there and what all the intersections are, then we can figure out, okay, what's the substrate beneath this one and maybe all of them? So is there a kind of uh, a universal theory of everything when it comes to these embodied um, awareness-based things? So we can learn from each other and figure out what's actually going on. Because I think each tradition has its own little piece of the puzzle, but no one tradition has all the answers. But I think I'd, I'd love to integrate these things together and create something more holistic, if you like. Hmm. Uh, sort of a curveball question here, but if say someone uh, extremely wealthy took your course and they liked it and they heard that you're interested in doing research and they're like, blank check, Michael, I'm going to write a blank check. You can do whatever research you want. Uh, what would you, how would you use those resources and what would you apply them towards? I think the first thing I want to look into is the neuroscientific basis behind these things. Mm -hmm. So take a number of AT practitioners and put them in different kinds of scanners, fMRI, that kind of thing, um, and see like what the hell is going on in their brains when um, they, they do their thing ultimately. Um, that would be cool. Um, so I suspect that in the same way as the, that, that classic, it's a cliche now, London taxi drivers have larger, I think it's a hippocampus because they, they, um, they do so much navigation around London with that map. I think there might be other effects of, I think, I think it's the, the prefrontal cortex on the right hand side is responsible for inhibition. Um, so preventing um, stimuli from, from progressing, if you like. Um, I wonder if mine's bigger. For example, or I wonder if mine is structured differently because I've been doing this. When and this AT, this awareness thing is very much a switch. It's kind of off, on. Like it's not a kind of um, build up. It's just like an on-off thing. What if I just turn that thing on and off in a, in a fMRI scanner? What would happen? I don't know enough about how the scanners work, but there must be some number of tests that you can do on people who have, in the same way as um, they have done this with meditators, right? So this. Person been a monk for thirty years, happiest man in the, in the world. Stuff. What's his brain look like? Well, okay. What does my brain look like? What does someone who's been doing this for thirty years? What does my teacher's brain look like? Um, I'd want to start there and kind of see if there are any clues drawn. That would be cool. I think. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a major interest for me is how this stuff intersects with, you know. Buddhism and meditation mm. and something that we've talked a fair bit about. And uh, yeah. I know you've done also some some Zen practice as well, uh, which makes you pretty interestingly positioned to sort of at least chew on how these things are related. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think um, increasingly a lot of the things that I'm really interested in are things that nobody's really an expert in, you know, like, yeah, mm. you know, you know a lot about Alexander technique, but like, um, and there are people that know a lot about meditation, deeply, very deeply practiced, but yeah, like how these things relate, there's no one expert in the world in those things. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that conversations like this are such a powerful way to sort of push the edge yeah. of what we know. And, um, yeah, I'd be, anyway, I'd be curious to talk about that with you. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts just for starters about like how it maybe how your own experience in exploring meditation training and Zen practice relates to, uh, you know, the stuff that you've been exposed to and been teaching with yeah. Alexander technique. Yeah. It's, it's funny how the, the, the language of Zen seems very similar to the language of AT in some, some sense. Um, when I, so I haven't, I'm not a, like a, a long-term practitioner of Zen. I, I had like a year and a half where I was quite into it, but beyond that, I'm not like, it's not part of my life now so much. Mm -hmm. But the the daily life practice, I think sila practice, um, that they espouse is basically give yourself wholeheartedly to whatever you're doing in every moment, um, which sounds easy, but is a horrifically difficult and often very painful experience. Um, it's like, oh, we do the washing up. I don't want to. Oh no, um, kind of stuff. Um, no podcasts. You can't do that. You have to be fully like you know there in the experience, um, and you encounter the same kinds of things. Basically, you encounter all the stuff that you're doing that isn't actually required for 
the activity you're doing. It's just this layering on of, you might call it ego or self or something of just like the, I don't want to, or the, the resistance or that kind of thing. So like, say you're doing the washing up, you're doing the dishes, you might find, well, why am I scrubbing way too hard? Why am I like really in here when I'm scrubbing? Like I'm really doing the dishes, you know? Oh, I can, I can zoom out. I can enjoy the moment. I can kind of be in, I can still be fully involved in the dishes while also not cutting off the rest of my life, which is kind of what like, just get the dishes done mode looks like. I hate this, this sucks, get, get it done quickly. Collapsed awareness, muscle tension, this moment of life sucks, that kind of stuff. But you can still bring full awareness and do it and enjoy the moment. Um, I think when, when I was doing Zen practice and I was more involved in AT at the time because of, of like COVID wasn't happening, I experienced a lot more moments of what I suspect is at least related to Kensho, the kind of, this, not enlightenment, but the kind of the flashes of like, oh, actually everything is one thing <laughs> kind of thing. Um, and that I think is only possible because of my AT work. I, I was insufficiently trained in Zen, I think, to deserve that kind of experience. Yeah. Um, but the same expansion of awareness and dropping of doing, cessation of doings, seems to point in the same direction as the wholehearted experiencing of the moment type stuff, the turning down of the loops that we get stuck in, basically. Um, I'm rambling slightly, so I'm curious uh, if any of that is interesting that we could pick up on. Oh, it's, it's definitely interesting. Uh... <laughs> It reminds me of, um, I mean, one of the, well, I, I'll just preface this discussion by saying I'm not enlightened. And so like, I am neither an expert in these things either, but it's, it's interesting to talk about. And um, one of the debates that you'll hear is like, are there multiple forms of enlightenment? And, you know, some people are like, no. And some people say, yeah, there are a lot of different kinds of enlightenment. Um, and from that, I've, I found it useful in my own practice to sort of think of multiple models for these things mm -hmm. of like what it might look like, because uh, yeah, just like, so I, I have sort of like a list of maybe like five, six, seven, eight models of like, this is maybe what it's like. And um, one of them would be that uh, your awareness is sort of permanently expanded that it, it almost can't contract. Uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know, this is interesting because you, you've sort of demonstrated that you can contract it at will, but like, yeah, that you, it can't involuntarily contract maybe. Mm. Um, and then it is just permanently expanded. And certain, I wouldn't describe my experience currently as it's permanently expanded. I'd say it's frequently more commonly than not expanded, but definitely not uh, permanently expanded or only contracted by will or something mm. like that. I wonder if that would, uh, yeah, what you think about that as a pot of possible, it, it seems like a worth a worthwhile goal in any case, even if it's not the same as enlightenment or something like that. Yeah, it's funny. What came to mind when you were speaking there was um, Eckhart Tolle, his experience of sitting on a park bench for two years in total bliss mm. um, after he had his, I guess, enlightenment experience. I'm thinking, mm. I mean, it sounds nice, but not very useful, mm. ultimately. Um, I'm not sure I would want that, actually. Um, if that's what enlightenment is and you're kind of just, oh, look, it's so joyful all the time. Mm. Um, I'd like to have access to that when I'm walking down the street through a park, just like, oh, let's have some bliss right now. That'd be nice. Let's have some non-dual awareness and just like everything is me for, for a while. That's cool. Um, but yeah, I guess like being, being almost forcibly taken there and then unable to leave it. I'm not sure I'd want that if that's mm. enlightenment. Um, mm. So you, you said kind of unable to contract awareness. I, I want to have conscious control over awareness, I think, mm -hmm. and be able to expand it most of the time. But sometimes I don't know if, when I want to, maybe I do want to. Um, my, my teacher has this great example of the one time you definitely want to have a collapsed awareness is walking through airport security. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to be interesting and expanded at that point. You want to be really, really boring, really <laughs> like uninteresting. So they just leave you alone, right? And <laughs> that's... You know, I, I can't think of many times in life where I want to turn down my aliveness, but you know, I want that choice. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. Um, that said, though, I mean, I've definitely experienced flashes of that overwhelming, like unified bliss state that I'd say Eckhart Tolle and I think other Enlightenment folks talk to, uh, point towards. Um, but they're never. I, mean, I don't live there. 
if if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Although they are they are more frequent than I think they used to be. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're certainly nice. I wouldn't want to like cling to it though. Uh -huh. Yeah, right, right. Um, I mean, that's another sort of model bouncing around in my head is just straightforwardly the reduction of suffering, so that there's no mm. no suffering and um, different definitions of what suffering are, but that would presumably, or I, I would be more interested in a reduction of suffering that involves like happiness and not yeah. suffering, not, um, so, but I, I think, I think at this point for me and my practice of this stuff, like it seems like a worthwhile goal to aim towards, uh, having my awareness expanded, mm. uh, consistently and uh yeah I, i'm pretty sure at that point i could like voluntarily choose to contract or like you know work with it fluidly in different ways but like that the, the default is expanded awareness and i think there's mm -hmm. there's for me at least there's there's more to go before i'm there yes yeah i'd, I'd certainly prefer to live with a kind of default open awareness and expanded awareness than default collapsed um just because when you collapse it's hard to get out of it if you don't know how you, you kind of forget that you're collapsed um, because you're caught in the loop of some kind. Um, when you expand, it's like, oh yeah, there's the loop I was just in. There's that collapse I was just in and there's everything else I've been missing out on. Um, but it's, I, I don't like using the word awakening, but when you come up, when like a teacher will kind of show someone, hey, there's all this as well. It is kind of like, oh, I didn't realize I was missing out on all this dimension of the world that wasn't there before it didn't it literally didn't exist for them um because they were closed off to it and i mean that very directly right it literally wasn't in their awareness and when something isn't in your awareness you can't attend to it it doesn't exist for you i use very simple examples in my course of like look you're in flow you're doing your work for a few hours and like suddenly you realize you had to use a bathroom two hours ago but you were in flow your awareness was so narrow that you couldn't notice that and because you couldn't notice that you couldn't do anything about it I'd rather have the open availability to like, I, I can do anything. I can go anywhere. I can think any thought. I can feel any feeling. And then I can navigate that world of openness rather than being stuck in a groove that's somewhat predetermined almost or somewhat um, set for me by circumstance and, and conditioning ultimately. And it's interesting that you mentioned that because I've, I've noticed recently, I, I've been drawing quite a bit in recent months and cool. drawing is like, I think it's because partly because of my extensive experience with meditation and all of this stuff, but it's, it's like one of the best things I've found for like entering a certain kind of concentration state, like really like mm. flow states, like what you're talking about. It's there are sort of, I think there are sort of other axes of like, um, you know, stability of attention or also like uh, bliss in the body. But mm. um but in terms of entering like flow states, like you're talking about drawing for me has been just, I so consistently get into a flow state when I draw. And I've also noticed that my awareness does tend to contract when I'm drawing and I, I, I do lose awareness of everything else. And I'm wondering if it's possible in your experience uh, to have that kind of a flow state and have a really expanded awareness. Yeah, I think it is. But one quick question though, on the moment that you come out of the flow state, when your awareness re expands and like, the spell is broken, do you notice what's going on with your body? Or when you look back, like, what was your body like in that period when you were in flow? Mm. I'd have to check, but my senses, um, I, I tend to have not great posture when I'm drawing and be sort of like, you know, I'm using my iPad and like yeah. sort of like, um, I don't know, I usually have my like legs folded in some way or something like that. And uh, there's just sort of an emphasis on it, body, body posture is not the emphasis at that time and, and drawing right. is. So that, I think that might be a variable. So that's worth paying attention to because mm -hmm. I found that collapsed awareness is correlated with a certain kind of slumping and muscle mm -hmm. tension ultimately. Mm -hmm. So kind of like you're kind of drawing, I'm exaggerating, but you're like drawing down here or something like really yes. tight and tension and collapsed and you know, you don't realize that you're hurting, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something going on. Again, I'd love to know more neuroscience than I do. Um, something about how the brain is wired, like it switches off that part of your, you, you need awareness to maintain certain kinds of body functioning, I think. When you give yourself 
awareness space your body can expand into that awareness space and your the primary control stuff the kind of the light stuff switches on when that goes away you're like heavy and you know a bag of meat as opposed to a floaty thing um ultimately um you had another question that i derailed <laughs> where were you going with that sorry oh just how is it mm, is oh, it yeah, possible so to be yes. both in a float state and have expanded awareness yeah that's it so i think yes but it's probably more difficult um and because we're just not used to it i think this is actually a question i'm getting a lot in in my forum which is like hey does this mean i can't concentrate on, i can't focus on things I i've lost the flow from expanded and i think being fair it is true that if your attention can go to more places it's more difficult to keep your attention on one thing so i think the collapse of awareness the habitual collapse of awareness is kind of like a cope for poor attention control in the sense that if you cut out the world it's very easy to focus on the one thing that's left in your world if you expand out yeah it can go anywhere however i don't believe that's necessary that you have to be that way and i give two examples in general for context where you might think of flow and awareness so flow not flow and collapsed and expanded awareness as like a two by two um so yeah we all know the kind of like your your drawing example your painting is like yes i'm i'm in flow and collapsed there's not in flow which is obviously easy as well but there's also a uh, expanded flow so imagine someone like a, a play on a football team playing a really important match right they're definitely in flow for most of the time because it's an important match they want to win that they're doing their thing but they also have wide open situational awareness they're aware of what everyone else is doing they don't catch the ball and throw it that way all that kind of thing that is an open flow similarly imagine a martial artist with um opponents on all sides um and anyone might attack at any time and if their awareness excludes that guy and kind of goes over here he'll attack vice versa like you can't cut anyone out but you also can't make an action you have to wait until they are until one of them makes a move then you respond appropriately in the moment spontaneously again that's definitely flow because you're going to be attacked by someone you're fully engaged and committed to the thing but your awareness is like 360 because you're situation has to, has to be there so i just think it's more difficult perhaps or it's not something we train particularly well and actually i want to get more into concentration type work meditation because i never actually i don't have good attention control um this is where we've way before 80 as well i don't want to suggest that 80 caused this i never had good um, control of my attention but i think there's there's value in training attention and awareness as separate things that happen to relate to each other in fun and interesting ways ultimately yeah this is this is giving me some ideas of like sort of things i could try of like yeah when i am drawing like expanding my awareness and checking my posture and then uh from the other end like it's almost like i did a lot of focus for years on the attention mm -hmm. training and uh, i i think ideally that would have involved more awareness training than i did as well uh but you know, I'm sort of catching up now and doing the awareness training with working yeah. on your course. And uh, it seems like almost now um, like a mm, learning edge for me with applying this stuff mm. is, can I use that directed attention while having the expanded awareness and, um, you know, do loving kindness or um, mm. do a breathe, maintain a breathing technique or, you know, focus on my body while doing Tai Chi or the drawing, like, stay with the experience of drawing and yeah. trying to create a particular thing, but also still have the awareness expanded. So that'll be an interesting edge for me to explore. I think there's a lot there. I think the, the expansion of awareness, I think relates to cessation of doing in some sense, the more expanded you are, the less you're doing. I think collapse corresponds to doing in that sense. So let's say that you're having a conversation with someone and an emotion comes up, right? What are your options? You can either, if your awareness collapses easily, you can either block out the emotion and keep talking to the person, or you can attend to the emotion and block out the person to some extent, neither of which seem optimal to me. But if you can stay expanded such that the person and the emotion and whatever else is there is in your awareness and the emotion kind of like move through you, you, you have that, that sense of detachment, not in a dissociated way. You can be fully experiencing it. And it's very much a, a kind of a, a meaningful, vivid part of experience, but it's not all of it. It's not hooked to you. So you can like, yeah, this thing is really going on right now. And I'm talking to you and, 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 and then it leaves because that's how emotions work. Because it's just kind of 
they're transient flowy things um this is one of the things i love about zen is the frame around the taming the bull gentling the bull thing it's like the the zen thing is grappling with the the emotional energy it's not an intellectual thing it's an emotional physical thing like fires in your body burning you away type thing rather than thinking about how the, nice the world is type of thing um that for me is at it's like fully experiencing the world in all its intensity without getting hooked on it so that's a fun thing to practice with i think mm. yeah yeah that's reminding me of just uh, uh i think a different way of describing that sort of detachment would be like having equanimity and uh yeah the the, the definition that I always heard was, which was from Shenzhen is, uh, you know, not, not uh, getting attached to something, not hold, clinging to things, not grasping to them, and then also mm -hmm. not pushing them away. Uh, so if it's pleasant, you're not clinging to it, trying to keep it. And if it's unpleasant, you're not trying to push it away either. You're just accepting it as it is. And that's not, yeah, that's definitely not like a, like repressive experience. It's a like yeah. liberating one. Yeah, it's hard to describe though. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, uh, I think it's one of the most important things to understand that difference. Um, mm -hmm. So you're not dissociating, you're not kind of repressing things or hiding from things. You're also not pulling towards you in a sense, like making or kind of reifying them. It's just, yeah, there it is. <laughs> it, it, this is the thing that is there. And my, my teacher's expression for this is like, there it is, and there's everything else. Mm. Like, it's all there, and this thing is in relationship to all of it. Cool. Great. Let's enjoy this moment. Um, and just to, it's just come to my mind. So one of the things that come from the last training session of how the training works is we'd spend like kind of less 10 minutes working with each other and just enjoying the moment, just like enjoy this moment as a, as a training prompt. And when you put your hand on someone and choose to enjoy this moment, you realize how much you're doing that interferes with enjoying the moment. Like, why am I thinking? Why, why, why am I obsessing? Why am I worrying about this thing? Why am I blah, blah, blah. Look at all the things I can turn down. And the more I turn things down, the more I enjoy this moment. And actually enjoying this moment and this one and this one is perfectly sufficient. Um, and then you can communicate that state to someone is a really magical thing to learn that you can do, I think. Um, as a, just as an experience, it's not quite meta, but it's like, hey, I'm just going to enjoy this moment now. Cool. That, that's the thing. Just enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's... Um... There's a traditional practice of <clears throat> focusing on the the three characteristics or the three marks mm -hmm. of existence, which are impermanence, uh, dissatisfactoriness or suffering, and and non-self. And then mm -hmm. um, I, I've been mostly Rob Berbea has uh, like an extension of that where you can sort. Of, he has these other frames that you can sort of. Um, just pay attention to those aspects of your experience. And, and mm. one of them is, is beauty where you just pay attention to everything that's beautiful nice. in your experience. Yeah, and yeah. those can be, have their own kind of feedback loops as well. So that sort of reminds me of what you're talking about. Yeah. This is what I mean as well, how these things seem to overlap and intersect so much, but mm -hmm. I don't think, I guess I'm, I'm learning in my life that I'm more of an integrator, um, kind of the jack of all trades and I don't want to go deep in any one thing, but there's so much that we could discover by just like talking to each other and, and finding all those things where it's the same. Mm -hmm. um, the whole reason why I started putting stuff on Twitter about AT was not because I wanted to make a course and quit my job and do that stuff. It was that I wanted to find out other stuff that was AT ultimately. Mm -hmm. But I know that I can't ask people that easily or Google, hey, Google, what things are phenomenologically like a lasagna technique? Um, that's not going to work. So if I, if I broadcast the stuff that I think AT is about and like, get people interested, other people will tell me, hey, that sounds like my thing, or that sounds like this thing over here. And that's, I think, the best way of building this map of interconnections. Um, and people saying, oh, have you read it in pro? This sounds like impro. Like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. cool. This sounds like the Master's Emissary. This sounds like drawing on the right side of the brain. Blah, blah, blah. This sounds like all the stuff around beauty. Cool. I would never have known this stuff unless I found a way to be a beacon for some of this phenomenology, or ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a bizarre uh, superpower that the internet provides, but it's one I plan to plan to exploit as much as I can. <laughs> yeah, I I'm definitely a sort of jack of all trades, preferring person as well. And I mean, I think I think in this conversation, it's been sort of evidence that like mm. yeah, I don't think it's actually a strict trade off of like mastery versus exposure or something like that. Because I think the more you do, kind of get the handle on different things, the easier it is to pick up new things like 
um, you know, uh, that, that, that's been my experience is like that these things just like have a momentum of their own. And if, if you learn new things, they're kind of easier to pick up each time. So, yeah, I think so. Um, and I think that's why I think I'm excited for different contemplative type people to get together and talk. Um, you know, what's your phenomenology like? What's your experience <laughs> of this thing? Like what dimensions am I missing? Um, why is it that it seems like the Buddhist frame is much more on attention and concentration than it is on awareness? Like, mm. I'm just curious about that. If I go and read a book about meditation, it's like, okay, breath, 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 kind of thing, not world, world, world. Um, why is that? I'm curious kind mm. of thing. Mm. Um, kind of a rhetorical question. If you have an answer, I'm very curious as to, as to why you think that might be that there's been that, that preference in that direction. Um, I mean, I think that's there's sort of popular Buddhism as presented in the West at this time. And mm. I don't know why that's, that definitely does focus on like breath and body stuff. And I think, I think that's, that's to some extent a mistake. It's, it's a reasonable, I mean, the breath and the body are so powerful, but you know, I, I prefer to focus on say love and kindness, or mm. I think, yeah, expanding awareness is a, is a great um, also thing to be exposed to, or like, internal family systems and parts work and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that those are kind of better starting points than the breath or the body. Um, although I think it is good to have just body awareness and breath awareness in practice as well. But, but I think in, in Buddhism, historically, there are branches or traditions that would emphasize awareness more than is emphasized in contemporary pop Western mm. Buddhist presentations, um, you know, I, I, I'm not as exposed to them myself, but yeah, I, th I think Zen to some extent and, mm. um, you know, things like Mahamudra or Dzogchen, like I, I get the sense, um, you know, I, I've not trained in any of those traditions directly myself, so I can't speak for them, but I get the sense from what I've heard that those uh, would emphasize expanded awareness more than, mm. uh, than you would think from contemporary Western uh buddhist presentations um yeah it's interesting because i don't know how much you know about the thesis of the master's emissary um i think you'd love it by the way um mm. but the thesis is left hemisphere is attention right hemisphere is awareness very broadly speaking and that all of society in the western world has become left hemisphere dominated ultimately so we see the world through this rational analytical decontextualized snapshotted kind of a thing 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 approach rather than cohesive integrated flowy um relationships which is what the right hemisphere does and it would be fascinating to me if the west took a right hemisphere version of buddhism and turned it into a left hemisphere version of buddhism which focuses more on the things the left hemisphere does well like conservation um over broad awareness if that that would be i, I can't prove this but it'd just be very fascinating if that's kind of the, the the quality of buddhism in the west is more left hemisphere aligned than right hemisphere aligned mm. that would just be fun interesting yeah i i've been exposed to it a little bit here and there but i haven't read the book myself i, I read his he has a shorter book that i have read a while oh, yeah. ago I ways of the attending title. i think yeah. yes yeah i read that a while ago and that was enjoyable mm. but um haven't read that i think it's, it's a pretty thick yeah. book yeah it, that's probably enough to be honest so you get the difference between well, the, the, the basics between the two hemispheres and it's a it's a 600 page book with tiny mm -hmm. bible pages and bible fonts it's ridiculous <laughs> um but yeah i just it, it seems to explain a lot um and it does just feel to me that if i if i made a left hemisphere buddhism it would look more like what you're describing of left the western buddhism as opposed to like dropping some of the, the stuff that doesn't make sense to the left hemisphere which is the the right hemisphere stuff ultimately mm-hmm mm-hmm yeah. 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 It reminds me of, um, I, ha I haven't read it in full, but there's this author that, um, is talking about Sun Tzu and, uh, he's sort of where this conditions consequences idea that I've talked to you about yeah. comes from. And, um, I think one of the main claims in that book is that like historically in the West, when Sun Tzu has been presented, it's like, there's an overemphasis on the, like, uh, bits that uh west the western mind can understand yeah. so like it's just kind of like um i don't know like 
sort of reduced to these like bumper sticker type things that are like not actually that useful out of context. It's like, why does everyone like Sun Tzu so much? But that like, if you have a different frame of mind that's sort of out, outside of mm -hmm. the sort of contemporary Western worldview that like, then it is an applicable strategy. Or I, I think he was talking about the same thing being true in, in the Tao Te Ching of like, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just sounds like, uh, bad poetry or something. I don't know. But uh, if you have this other sort of other state of mind or view of the world, then then it starts to make a lot more sense. Yeah, I was thinking about the Tao Te Ching as you were speaking there in the opening lines, you know, the Tao that can be described is not the Tao, that can be mm -hmm. named is not the Tao. And like, this is the same thing as Kant's kind of design technique is like, just tell me how it works. Just tell me what to be experiencing. And like, no, no, I can't do that. Because if I could describe it, it wouldn't be it. I can only point towards things that you can then figure out as, oh, it's, that's the Tao, if you like. And as soon as you try and name it, you lose it. <laughs> that makes sense if you have this like broad integrated awareness, right hemisphere, whatever it is, thing switched on. But the part of you that wants to figure that stuff out can't itself figure it out on its own, <laughs> weirdly enough. Um, and I think the more, it's weird, like, I want to say the more rationally minded someone is, the more difficult it is for them to access this other thing, because that's what the left hemisphere does. And that's what that, that frame explains it as. But a lot of my students are, you know, coders, um, and they're very much like traditionally left hemisphere type people. And yet they seem to be like coming to like, hang on, there's something else here. I'm very stuck in my head in my whatever I want to get out of my head. And there's a recognition of it. And that recognition, I guess, can only come from the other bit. Otherwise, it wouldn't it wouldn't know itself. It wouldn't know that there's a thing to be recognized ultimately. And I know I, I wonder if there's some kind of awakening going on around people seeing that there's a bit more there's a, a side of experience that's being missed out on and looking for ways to access ways to figure out what that thing is. Obviously, you come up against the thing that you can't describe it. You can't put words around it or an analytical frame, but you can still make sense of it in a different way. And it's that different way that I think excites me quite a lot. Seems like there's a, a skill of, like if someone points to something without needing to understand it conceptually, like looking for it in your own experience yeah. and, and finding it in your own experience. Um, I, I wonder what goes into that skill. I, I think I wasn't very good at it for a long time. And then I'm noticing just in this conversation, like you've pointed to several things and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go and look for that in my own experience. And it, it feels much more um, tractable now to like look for things with that skill. And I don't, I don't actually know. I mean, some of it I think is just experience and like mm. noticing that you can go look for things in your own experience, but, um, yeah. but uh, and that they're not the concept or description of the thing like we talked about earlier, but uh, I'd be curious if, if that reminds you of anything or like what goes into that skill in your experience. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. It's kind of like a, a meta noticing skill that also comes with not getting stuck in any one of the layers of noticing. Um, so you can kind of like noticing all the way down kind of thing while keeping zoomed out. And I'm reminded of a meditation that was described by um, Alan Watts, um, a walking meditation where he says, you know, there is lifting of the foot. There is the inclination there is the feeling of the lifting of the foot and there is the tendency of the lifting of the ten of the foot and you just go, go down further and further and notice things that are further and further back so there's the feeling there's the desire there's the whatever there's the thing like the fact that i want to there's the fact that i might want not, not to interfere with it and all that kind of stuff and you can just notice these more and more abstract layers i think a lot of people again don't go there and until it's pointed out to you that you can go there why would you unless you're particularly curious about the nature of your own experience. People tend not to be because there's a lot going on, I think. Um, but yeah, once it said like, you know, go off and play with the, the sensate, go off and play with how you know, like how aware someone else is as a question. Well, okay, how do I know? Okay, what am I, I can, I can analytically look at where their eyes are. I can analytically kind of figure out from what I'm seeing, or I can kind of go inside like, okay, how can I, how can I just know what someone else's awareness is doing what are the signs in me what okay I mean, that's interesting okay i my own awareness does things um i feel more connected to them when their awareness expands okay what does that mean what does what does it mean to have more connection with someone what does that feel like what are the what are the phenomenological stuff that goes with connection to, and all of this stuff that just goes from there 
Um, once you open that rabbit hole, I think there's a lot of fun stuff that just kind of shows up like in life as you're walking around doing doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. It seems like just having that attitude of curiosity is such an important element of this. Of just like, well, I, I don't know, but I'm going to look and yeah. what what is going on here. And uh, that's definitely been one of the most fun fun things about your course is like noticing just how much there is to get curious about. Like, like one of the things I got really curious about was like, um, you know, um, I do tai chi and standing meditation every day and i usually do them outside because it's, it's preferable to do that or or i'll dance outside and in all of those nice. activities when i'm outside like i'll i'll feel and i've talked to you about this like i feel people's awareness on me like oh they're yeah. they're like what is this guy doing he's like standing there dancing or whatever and it's like how do i, I got really curious how do i know that these people are paying attention to me right now that they're like eh, what's this guy doing uh and it, it's like, it's not just um, a visual field thing of like just mm. noticing them. So like, how do I know uh, if I, so, cause sometimes I can't see and like someone behind mm. me, I'm like, there's someone behind me, you know, uh, looking at me, how do I know that? And that's been really interesting to get curious about. Yeah, totally. And there's, I guess, two things to say in response to that is like, yeah, how, how do you know that? Like what, okay, what are the, what are some of the sensations come by? How, what are the things that you notice that alert you to that? sensation to that to that thing going on what what are they that i've noticed yeah for me? I'm, yeah i'm sorry like how like how do you know what are the things that allow you to this fact for you yeah um i think for one i have my expanded my awareness expanded and for two i'm, I'm sort of aware that the thing i'm doing is something that people might yeah. look at uh and i'm aware of sort of the layout of the place and like where people might be. And um, sometimes it seems to be sort of visually triggered of like someone is like walking into my visual field and I'm aware of that, but other times it's not. And I think that there are, uh, yeah, like emotional or physical body sensations that arise that seem to be um, almost like have a location quality to them where it's like telling me that someone from yeah. a certain direction is because I, I it's like very direction oriented like this direction mm -hmm. you know uh so that that's been what i the sense i've been able to make of it so far i think mm, that's cool um yeah the the um the experience of the impingement of awareness someone else's awareness on your awareness is a very real thing mm -hmm. um so this is the thing I, I talk about in the, the the speaking power of like when someone is collapsing their awareness on you, as I'm trying to emulate now with the, the the camera, like there is a thing it feels like to be on the receiving end of this. Yes. Right. This is a little bit aggressive or creepy or intense or whatever, and like you are experiencing something that alerts you to the fact that this is weird. And if I zoom out again, then it kind of goes away a little bit, and that thing eases. The hell is that <laughs> you know and it's just it's fascinating that this is a thing that can be experienced and i think people would benefit from having more sensitivity to this stuff because it's stuff that's going on anyway like if someone's being that way towards you and you're not aware that at the meta level that's what's going on you'll just feel weird you might form opinions about them they might be doing it unconsciously without realizing but you feel ill towards them or you feel like pressured or something but as soon as this stuff becomes in your awareness as like a meta level, then you can like, okay, I still feel the thing, but I'm also like aware of what's causing it and I can take measures to defend myself against it. Um, I also just want to say like, when we're talking about stuff like, you know, I can tell when someone is looking at me type stuff, we very quickly get into the realm of, um, well, that can't work, can it? Scientific, um, rational, like, I don't know the mechanisms by which this could work, therefore it can't work kind of kind of thinking which is kind of how i used to be now i'm a little bit more flexible with this stuff like okay look i know about confirmation bias i know about all the all the failings of the human mind in a, in a sense but at the same time i've been testing the same kind of dynamic processes enough times now in different settings that i know that something happens when something else happens ultimately i know what it feels like quite reliably i just don't know how it works yet so i assume there is some mechanism behind these things and I'm curious what they are, but I don't want to throw out the fact that this thing is real just because I can't think of a mechanism by which it could work, if that makes sense. There's some kind of like holding a paradox in there. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, that's 
um, my own orientation towards these things is like putting my own experience at the forefront. And when you do that, when you put your own experience or reality at the forefront, like your explanations for what's happening are very impoverished compared to the actual experience. Um, all kinds of things happen to me in my experience mm -hmm. that like, mm, not only do I not have explanations for it, but a lot of them, like, I, I like, I could could describe them verbally, but it would take me far longer to describe them verbally than it than it would to just experience the thing. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, like one thing that comes to mind is at least for me associated with this kind of phenomenon is like it, it certainly seems to me that um, when you have this sort of experience of someone else's awareness in, interacting with your awareness. Uh, that there's sort of a, um, a, you can get like a read on what their experience mm. is like, that there, there's sort of like leakage of what emotions there are, like totally. what their thoughts are or what it's like to be them or how their body feels or things like yep. that. Um, has that been your experience as well? Absolutely. You can tell a lot from, it's, it's a combination of yes, seeing things like if someone looks tense and tight, you can kind of infer things, but there's also a kind of like a, an energetic feel as well mm -hmm. like just being around it's like oh this person feels heavy in some way okay and then you get the same question like in what way how do i know this feels heavy like what mm -hmm. am i feeling that and you can kind of go down that route as well but yeah there's something about <sighs> something else knows things beyond the rational mind i guess mm -hmm. i put it that way and mm -hmm. then it, it get that that rational mind thing gets signals from somewhere else and interprets them but there's, there's danger in cutting off from it so you can look at someone like, yeah, this person seems heavy, this person seems sad. I don't know how I know that, but you know, more often than not, that assessment is correct. That intuitive sense is right, mm -hmm. um, and that that really interests me, honestly. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like that's that's all. Like, still don't believe it fully. Like, okay, like I have a sense this person is stressed or heavy or sad, but let's test that. Mm -hmm. But I'm still going to use that information as something that could be true. Yes. Right? There is something here around people often ask me well like isn't it useful to signal things in social contexts right so if i if i give an example like i can think right i'm thinking really hard right now and i'm showing you that i'm thinking <laughs> or I'm, I'm gonna think i'm thinking right now but you can't tell that i'm thinking because I'm not doing the thinky stuff. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So like people say, well, isn't there value in, you know, signaling the fact that I'm thinking so they don't interrupt you or whatever, like may, maybe, but wouldn't you rather consciously do that performatively if you want to, as opposed to using muscle to make your brain work better, which it doesn't do, it just gets in the way because what, what is this? Uh -huh. <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> so like, I think people leak stuff in that way. They leak stuff by layering on all the things that it looks like to experience their lives internally without realizing they're doing it. And that's what I think oftentimes we pick up on. So if I'm thinking, if, if we were both like ATs and master people and both like thinking without expressing thinking, it might be harder to figure out that yes, they're thinking, right? But still, I'd rather be that way than stuck in, in performative signaling, ultimately, mm -hmm. or unconscious performative signaling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Me too. Yes. I sometimes on this podcast, like people have trouble reading me because I'm just like yeah. listening attentively to what people have to say, you know? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've had to like work on emoting again, you know? Uh, but um, th that might just be a personality quirk too, though, easily. But um, it, it's something that I've noticed with this is like, the, of this like having awareness of other people's experience or mm. a, a read on it is like uh at least to me it seems like i tend to be aware of things in other people's experience that i have experienced for myself in my own mm. experience in the past and and it interesting like it's like because i have the self-knowledge of this kind of thing in my own experience then i can no notice it or recognize it in other mm. people and there's been an interesting thing with that of like, I guess when I first started noticing that this sort of thing was possible, I was sort of like aversive to it because I was like, oh, what yeah. are other people going to know about me? Like, oh, like, yeah. for example, like, is Michael judging me right now? Because my awareness is contracted and like, is he going to think I'm a terrible person or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, 
at least for me, as that sort of unfolds in my own experience, there's compassion associated with it. Because like, if there is something that I notice about someone else, and even if it's negative, it's like, that's mm. nothing I've never seen in my own mind. Like, you know, uh, I, I'm not recognizing things in other people that I've not experienced myself. And so mm. there's not like a divisive, like, oh, this person is terrible. They're worse than me kind of thing. It's like, I, f- I feel compassion for them of like, wow, like I've been there and like, that makes sense. And it's easier to hold it sort of lightly than like judgmentally or something like that. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, and I think what comes up for me when you were talking there is that this expanded awareness thing come, brings with it a sense of being seen, mm. right? So like, if you're expanded, that means, and I'm, I'm going to speak a little bit, whether metaphorically or literally, I'm not sure, but let's just, let's go with it. Um, when you, when you, let's say, blend your awareness with someone else, like you're in the same awareness space, you are suddenly aware of them looking back at you. You're suddenly aware of being seen as someone who has the same kind of experience as someone else is having. Mm. Like, so right now I'm looking at a lens, I'm looking at your face on the camera on a screen and like, yeah, you're, you're pixels, you're a human cool. But inside of your head, you're having the same experience of me as I'm having of you right now. Mm-hmm. And if I cut myself off from you, I'm like, yeah, I'm talking to some pixels and like, I just <laughs> seeing you as, as I'm just seeing you as pictures. Cool. Oh shit. Now you can see me like actually see me. Like it's like you're, you're seeing into my experience in a sense. And that's scary at first. It's much easier to, to kind of talk to pixel touching than it is to talk to like this, the thing that I'm experiencing in the world, experiencing me. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh, okay. There's a level of like, okay, let me just like there's a kind of uh I think Reich talked about this, like character armoring of like turning like stepping through that character armor and like allowing yourself to be with someone being seen means that yeah, they might see your your flaws, they might see your the things that you don't like about yourself. Chances are they'll look at you with compassion. Um, if they're the kind of person who's used to doing this at least, mm-hmm. then sure. But you are you are kind of putting yourself out there to be seen in a much more, a much deeper way than if you, you know, cut yourself off and cut awareness off and that kind of thing. Like now I'm, I feel protected. I feel like there's an armor here, there's a shell, but I can't, I'm not connecting to you. Whereas if I connect to you, it's a little bit vulnerable. There's, a, there's something that opens up there. It's like you can kind of see into me in some sense. Mm. And mm. again, there's that question of like, how do I, what does it feel like? How do I know that? that we can kind of play with as well, which is interesting, mm-hmm. but I love this stuff as well. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm really grateful that this is primarily a video podcast because there's just so much <laughs> happening in your, in this interaction, I'm sure yeah. on my face as well, that there's like a lot of layers that just make it really visually interesting. Speaking uh, of video, I'm quite dark here because it's the UK and it's cloudy. So let me just put uh-huh. the lights on. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Looks good. Um, and, you know, and, and something I had to learn with this stuff is like, it, it was uncomfortable to realize that other people can see more about you than you were aware previously, but like, yeah. that's already happening. You know, like we're already putting out all of this information in exactly. the world. Like it's not, there's no, there's no, hmm, I don't even know how to put this, but like concepts of privacy are not what you thought they were or something like there's yeah that, that's like uncomfortable but 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 it's true like you when you have a face you know people can see things about your face or your body or that just are there and uh it doesn't help to like fight that just because you i don't know i i i, I think i was maybe clinging to a notion of privacy at some point or something like i just want to be me <laughs> uh you know whatever yeah. but i i know what you mean um and actually just like, even in this context right there's we're being recorded mm-hmm. and like I can only see you but you're recording on both screens at once right so mm-hmm. I've forgotten almost that I'm I'm being recorded in a mm-hmm. sense and it's a very interesting experience to be talking to someone in a conversational yeah hanging out kind of way while also knowing that like all of your facial expressions are being captured for someone to watch so, like hey person watching like I know you've been looking at my face the whole time or Tashin's face and like every little twitch every little like gesture every little like do I rub my nose or like I don't know, have a drink and then like, whatever, like those things become much more aware. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm being seen right now. Mm-hmm. There's two ways. Okay. You can either cut away from that or you can embrace it. I feel like most of us kind of default to that, that privacy thing that you're talking about. Like if I just, 
if I just forget that they're looking at me, then they can't see me. Ultimately, then I'm not being seen. There's that wonderful um, creature in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where if it assumes that if you can't see it, then it can't see you, <laughs> which is mm. absurd. But that's the point. So the, the advice is wrap a towel around your head so that you can't see it, <laughs> then it can't see you. <laughs> and it kind of feels like that a little bit. <laughs> like, it's okay if I can't see Tashin, he can't see me. So it's fine. <laughs> but we can feel safe now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. We, we do we do silly things, and so much of AT again is like, look, we mean this lovingly, we mean this kindly, but most people are doing silly things to themselves. They don't know them doing. The classic example that like this is a very silly one, but like, look, you've seen this like tourists doing this in. Um, I don't know if I can just make sure I can see myself so I don't get off the off the screen, but like taking a photo, but like this. You know how you kind of people like lean back to get uh -huh, more uh -huh. of, like get more of the thing in frame. Like just take a step back. Uh -huh. why, why 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 are you doing all this nonsense? Yeah. Like people don't realize that they're abusing themselves in some sense when they could have a much simpler, more elegant, easier alternative to do. Mm -hmm. We just have all this conditioning that we don't have matter awareness of or don't know how to stop. It's so much of this going all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's hard to notice. Um, I mean, anytime I'm in with other people, really, I, I can notice now if their awareness is contracted or yeah. expanded and it's it's hard to notice how how often people's awareness is contracted and uh yeah that that makes me sad sometimes yeah yeah it it is again i try to avoid the judgment but it mm -hmm. does kind of come up like oh it must it seems like it's difficult to live that way and i used to live this way myself right i spent almost 30 years um kind of trapped in my own i want to say my own body but like slightly out of sync from the world living in a projection of my thoughts describing the world rather than the world itself mm -hmm. and that's what i think all of these practices get us out of it's whether it's at whether it's other mindfulness traditions it's like okay well all that's going on and there's the world as well look hey it's so shiny and vivid and bright cool there's all these things that you can experience but until that's been shown to you in some way and you're again that word i don't like but awakened to it then it's just not accessible and i i want to help people i don't think everyone should live that way i want them to have the option to if they want to that's important mm -hmm. if you if you have if you're shown the zen garden and like this is there's this thing here i don't want it fine good for you more power to you great but at least have someone show you it's there mm -hmm. and then explore it if you want to right yeah definitely that, uh, that's why i'm so glad that you're course exists especially because it's structured in a way that can sort of scale like you don't have to yeah do if it I can figure certain things times. out but yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well, they're always, always learning you know um yeah I'd, I'd be one one question I'd be curious to ask as well is um yeah like how how your vision of how this stuff relates to society is because mm -hmm. a lot of this that we've talked about is like individual experience or like interactions with others but i know you've sort of alluded in places to this having possibly broader civilization scale implications and be curious to hear you riff on that yeah this is something i keep sitting with um but there's, there's something here i want to integrate all this energy stuff with the non doing stuff but there's, there's mm -hmm. two things i think that come to mind here one is that cessation itself is a thing that can be done because people often like often confuse not doing something with the opposite of that thing, right? So if I use an example from the real world, I think it would make sense to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, right? We know they're not good. We know that if the market does its thing, then things will realign. So let's say, okay, I propose we stop subsidizing fossil fuels. That's cessation. It's very, very easy and a quick hand to go, okay, what should we do instead? Like nothing no, no 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 further doings required just stop doing that <laughs> right that's enough and then see how the system recalibrates itself in the absence of this forcing thing that you're putting into it doesn't mean you have to go and put that money into other programs just stop doing this and see what happens okay i don't think we're good at that as a, as a species even we're so like conditioned to do something that the idea of not doing something breaks us in some sense, it just doesn't occur to us. Um, that they're very different interventions. Um, so like when I was saying here, like slouch, this, this is slouching, the absence of slouching is not this. This is still slouching, just more upright. 
<laughs> this is the absence of slouching. And <laughs> that's, that's different. They're, they're different things. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I'd like to see more. More. It's almost a more of a Taoist perspective as, as applied to civilizational progress of like the minimum level of interference necessary, I think, is the way to go. So all the things, if imagine that there's like some kind of supercomputer, like that could catalog all the thing, all the doings that we're doing. What's the minimum level of doings that we can do, if you like, for things mm -hmm. to function well? I, I suspect that the less that we can do intelligently and you know, clearly you know, thoughtfully, the better things run. I think things get stuck when we're like, hmm, this thing is over here isn't working very well. Let's layer in another doing. <laughs> right, let's add more doings. Mm -hmm. And suddenly you end up with this massively overcomplicated system that's fragile and can break easily. I'd rather have fewer doings and see what happens. So that's one thing that comes to for climate change in particular is, yeah, we can do things, but okay, what else can we stop doing? Mm -hmm. The other thing that came to mind when um, when thinking about this intersection is the idea that if something isn't in your awareness, it's not accessible to you. You can't relate to it if it's not in your awareness. And I think that as a as a civilization, we are lacking for our awareness doesn't extend to certain futures or to certain pathways. So I, I think I alluded to it before. But when I say awareness, I don't just mean spatial awareness. I mean, conceptual or conceptual space, possibility space, and also the body stuff as well. So in the absence of knowing that we can go a certain direction to the future, we can't go there. Right, we we can only go to the place that we can conceptualize. So we are lacking stories ultimately. So I think a really important thing that we should be doing is telling lots and lots and lots of diverse, positive stories for the future, all kinds of different good stories. And what we end up with won't be any of those, but it'll be more in the direction of those things than all the bad stories we're telling ourselves. If we keep repeating the same, we're going to burn in a fiery, fiery hell stories we're going to nudge ourselves towards that because that's what we're orienting ourselves towards. So yeah, I, I would like to see more basically possibility space opening up for how we think, how we want things to be that will actually help us orient ourselves towards those things. So hmm. these, these are two areas that I think AT applies. And then at the individual level, like the more people are free of their own conflicts that are interfering less with their bodies and functioning well, which is what AT is about. I think, well, it makes sense that society is made of individuals. And if those individuals are, in some sense, not functioning well, then the society that they're, they're comprising won't function well either. So the more that we can resolve our own stuff, the better the system that we're a part of will function as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely agree with all that. And I, I know you were talking earlier about the, the climate stuff, and it made sense like that there'd be all these different options and that you'd have mm -hmm. awareness of them, possibility spaces, you described it. And I love that you sort of uh, made that explicit and added in the the non-doing like oh we could just stop doing certain things yeah. that aren't working for it. that that, that <laughs> is a novel <laughs> idea there my friend that is a novel idea but that shouldn't be novel that's the yes, thing but yes. it, is, it is like mind-blowing we can just not do things and then, yes. but then what no 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 just just, <laughs> just stop just stop doing the thing uh -huh. yeah michael ashcroft for president 2024 <laughs> yeah no oh, okay yeah. <laughs> we'll see yeah 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 uh, i think i have to become american first but yeah <laughs> you're like i'm not gonna do anything yeah. global yeah, world nothing. leader i will do nothing exactly i'm gonna do less and less and less <laughs> until things work better yeah i love it where, where do i sign up yeah uh is there anything uh close to you anything that we've talked about that you'd like to say more about or talk more about I don't think so. I mean, I'm impressed that we've gone for two hours and I'm not mm -hmm. bored and like it still feels like a very fresh and, and like lively conversation. So yeah, thanks. Thanks to your obvious skill as a, as a podcast um, podcast host and interviewer that like it just flowed so well. So yeah, thank you for having me on. Mm, my pleasure. And I'm hoping we'll do it again sometime. There's definitely more to, more to discuss. Yeah. I suspect we will. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Michael. Good. Thank you.